from a domestic divorce perspective, again, staying with, with India, uh, and here's the questions on the basis on which the Indian court will actually exercise jurisdiction to, to grant a divorce. Is it the, on the basis that the couple were resident in India, domiciled, citizens of India? What, what's the basis? Uh, whether uh, the court may exercise discretion to divide matrimonial property, is there a concept of that? Whether prenuptial and postnuptial arrangements are enforceable in India. And then finally, uh, whether an Indian court would seek to make orders that have extraterritorial effect, because obviously Akash holds assets around the world, so they, they, that would be within the mix of potential um, matrimonial property. So the basis on which an Indian court would exercise jurisdiction yeah. Sure. Thanks, Zach. So uh, before I start, Zach, I should caveat again that Indian personal laws are religion specific. So just to give you an idea, there are several legislations under which couples could get married in India. If both the individuals who are getting married are Hindus, then uh, they could potentially register under the Hindu Marriage Act. If it is a couple from different religions, then we have something called the Special Marriage Act. Uh, and if it is, for instance, Indian origin individuals who live outside India, then we have a foreign marriage act that could potentially apply. So you need to look at what is the relevant legislation under which the individuals are married to figure out uh, how, how the divorce procedure would work. Uh, just to give you a sense, under the Hindu Marriage Act and the Special Marriage Act, some of the situations where uh, an Indian court could exercise jurisdiction uh, are if the marriage was solemnized in India or if the respondent um, is resident in India at the time that the petition is presented or if the parties to the marriage last resided together in India. Right. Uh, so these are some situations where an Indian court would exercise jurisdiction uh, under the Hindu marriage or special marriage legislations. And similarly, under the Foreign Marriage Act, an Indian court may grant a divorce if the parties to the marriage are domiciled in India at the time that the petition is presented, or if the petitioner being the wife was domiciled in India just before marriage right. and resided in India for a period of at least three years just before the petition is presented. So this is primarily to, to deal with a situation where an Indian resident woman gets married and then moves abroad. Uh, and then registered under the Foreign Marriage Act, but then the marriage breaks down and she comes back to India. Right, right. Uh, so it would it would depend, but broadly speaking, if there's residency in India or domicile in India, there's a fairly good possibility that an Indian court would exercise uh, court would exercise jurisdiction. Right. Um, and this would apply to division of matrimonial property as well. Uh, although since, uh, you know, we discussed that there isn't a concept of community, it would basically be the individually held property that they would look to divide. Sure. Um, on prenuptial and postnuptial agreements, again, it would depend on the personal law that is applicable. So, for example, Hindu marriages are considered sacraments. They're not considered contractual. Uh, so you don't consent to a Hindu marriage in the way in which you would consent to a Muslim marriage, for instance. Uh, so Muslim marriage under Sharia law is not valid unless both parties say that they accept the marriage. Uh, and so the nature of these two under the respective personal laws is, is, is essentially very different. And that, uh, that sort of motivates how a prenuptial or a postnuptial agreement would be treated as well. So although we don't have specific laws dealing with this, uh, we do have a general provision in our contract act that says that agreements and restraint of marriage are not valid. Right. And courts have relied on this provision to interpret how a prenuptial or a postnuptial agreement uh, should, be, should be considered. Right. And in some situations, they have been held to be valid so long as they don't, uh, they're not against public policy. So, so long as the court doesn't assume that they're motivating the couple to break up the marriage, they can be considered to be held valid. But it would be a very fact-specific uh, decision, and it would also be motivated by the respective personal law and how it approaches the concept of marriage. Right, right. Um, extraterritorial orders. So this is a slightly more elaborate question. Uh, the short point is, yes, it would be possible for an Indian court to, uh, to pass an order that applies to foreign assets. But it would depend on a number of things. So, for example, under our uh, conflict of laws principles, we have the concepts of effectiveness and submission. 
and what these mean is that the effectiveness means that a court can only pronounce a judgment in a case where it can execute the decree within its own territory right uh, whereas submission means an acceptance of the authority of a court to pass judgment so before an indian court uh, you know passes judgment in relation to foreign assets it would undertake this analysis right but in most situations what would happen is that uh, the domicile related the nexus principles that we discussed in the context of when a court would take up a divorce case yes. that nexus would automatically give them the ability to pass this judgment right. so what they would then do is as long as the party is domiciled in india they would pass the judgment in relation to foreign assets but then that judgment would need to be enforced in the relevant foreign country uh based on whether it recognizes india's ability to grant that divorce or not right um and the supreme court has also provided some guidelines in respect of uh, of how this could possibly be done so for example if there's a divorce proceeding that's filed in india then the parties need to make a disclosure of foreign assets in that proceeding okay very good very good so i think from just following on from that she over look at how this can be uh, how this will affect in the case of akash his assets overseas um so would a uae court recognize and enforce an order issued by an indian divorce court and can a difc trust be varied or terminated by an order issued by an indian divorce court so diana from this instance we're looking at obviously the marriage breakdown between satna and akash and we have an order emanating from an, an indian court which is pro- pro- effectively um, proposing to split possibly the shares of the company and potentially um bringing the trust to an end is, is this is this likely to be enforceable or recognized in the UAE and particularly in well, the DIFC well um re- let me start by saying that if i was instructed to enforce a foreign judgment whatever it may be including a, a divorce judgment from india uh, i would say the uae civil procedures law has quite strict provisions that may be difficult to meet by many of those divorce court orders um unless and say for if there was a treaty between the UAE courts and another court for the um enforcement of judgments now we have very little treaties right. so most of these court judgments that are for divorce are hardly enforced right. despite the fact that we had a, a great amendment to the civil procedures law 2 years ago but it did not really break the public order uh, you know um, challenge that we would always have to way in a way start on that nexus in order to enforce a, a judgment right. now if we're talking about the dfc trust yes particularly yes. now let me say that the dfc if it's not a trust like let's say the business is part of a difc and the foreign court judgment is coming from um a court that has had some agreement with the difc the dfc courts are much more lenient on enforcing judgments than the onshore courts that's for sure however for the specific issue of a trust um it is quite um as i explained to you earlier um zack that although there are the firewalls in the trust law of difc that would not enable much of a foreign court judgment to 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 come through and change um the the rights of the beneficiaries and yeah. however it it seems that it's very clear that there is um uh, some kind of um let let's let's call it um like you know the the trust law would allow what is a community mm. um um property mm. uh, that would come into the courts of DIFC challenging a trust to be accepted right right Why? on the basis that originally the ownership of this trust was not mainly for the settlor in this right. case right. so but the DIFC law trust law would allow it right but in the case of a court order that was uh, community linked it was just a sort of discretionary order to um to uh, vary the terms of the trust 
under an Indian proceeding, that the firewall protections under the DIFC um, would, station, they exactly. would be available, wouldn't they? Right. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Okay. Thanks very much, Diana. And, and turning now to the US side, will the US court recognize and enforce a similar order emanating from the from an Indian um, divorce court? Um, and I'll yeah. the same today. So from your side, uh, John and Ivan, what, what say you? That, that, thanks, Zach. So the, the short answer is yes. Um, it's going to vary, though, on a state-by-state -state basis, because uh -huh. unlike taxation, we're not looking at a federal tier from an enforcement perspective. So divorce is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. It'll depend on the state law, their uh -huh. definition of residency, and their approach to certain community property rules. Um, as we'll see in later slides, and we'll save the, the more full discussion of this for the, the U.S. source or the U.S. Uh, resident discussion we'll have in the second example, but you'll see that California that Ivan is admitted in and, and will speak about is a little more aggressive in this regard than other states like my home state of Kansas in the, in the center of the U.S. Uh, but in general, the answer here is yes, the, the court's going to recognize it. And in a situation like this with little to no connection, assuming that one of the owners is not living in that property, they're using it as investment purposes, um, probably very little connection from a U.S. law perspective. They would just uh, enforce the order and deal with it the way that the other country had said. Right, right. Okay, so a similar one for me to the UK. I think the UK is a bit different. So the UK will generally, even at common law, there's a few statutes that deal with sort of the enforcement recognition. They would tend to only look at a, a, a an order that has a, a sort of monetary side to it. So they would only look at liquidated damages uh, as a way of enforcing where the Indian court order was effectively trying to sever property or transfer property. I think they would find it quite difficult to enforce that in a UK um, UK court on a reciprocal basis. 